Uh, levels that are in your seats, that's page 943. So, First John 4, verses 9 and 16. And before you do that, as you guys turn there, I just want to say, uh, if you don't know me, my name is Ty, I'm a Miller student. This uh, middle row here of Miller students, we're back from our Christmas break. We've been in school for the last week. We took a week, took a week long course. Um, some people are taking a bachelor's course. I was taking a week long Greek class, which I don't really recommend because my brain is fried. Uh, some people are taking a class on creationism and there's one more camp ministry, which is sweet because we're at camp all year long. Around. So that was cool, that's awesome. So good to be back here, uh, singing with you guys, uh, talking with you guys, having coffee with you guys. It's so good to be back in St. Louis. You've blessed us, uh, Miller students, so much. So we're going to read from 1 John 4, verses 9 to 16. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only Son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. And God has given us his spirit as proof that we live in him and he in us. Furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now testify that the Father sent his Son to be, in the Savior, to be the Savior of the world. All who declare that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them, and they live in God. We know how much God loves us, and we put our trust in his love. Heavenly Father, thank you that you love us so much, that everyone in this room, that from reading that, from knowing you on a personal level, that we know what love is. You've showed us what love is. We can love others because you've loved us first. That is the source of our love. That is an example of our love. That is um, how we know what love is. And how can we not share that with each other? And it's beautiful that you say that when we love each other, that you are shown through that. We can't see you, but that is how people see you, is through how we love one another, how we go out of our way, how we sacrifice for each other, how we inconvenience ourselves for the betterment of each other. That is what love is, and you did that ultimately on the cross. And as we sit here and reflect upon your love, um, rest in your love, trust in your love, and put your, our faith in your love, that you'll bring this reassurance and a peace that can only come from you, as well as the motivation and desire to love others. Um, thank you for Bob, and that he loves us so well. He loves sick moose, and that he knows your love. Uh, and he comes and shares that with us each Sunday. Um, be with him as he speaks to us today, and let our hearts be open and soft towards your word. Pray these things in your holy name. Amen. This is chapter one. It's really hard to find, I know. But uh, on the Bibles, um, on these pages in uh, the Bible that we have in our chairs, thanks to the Gideons, it's page three, um, after all the helps at the beginning. But um, the story of the Scruggs has everything to do everything to do with what we're talking about this morning. We're not just talking about philosophy or cold hard facts or doctrine that's like boring, but this stuff has everything to do with what put them back together. What we're going to talk about this morning, because we're talking about the Trinity and where we came from. And Christianity is different um, from other religions in that we have a God that mankind couldn't have thought up. You know mankind thought up Zeus because Zeus would um, seduce women and punish people that disagreed with him. And, and you could tell a man invented Zeus. No man could have invented the Trinity. It doesn't make any sense that we would think this up. And where we come from, as you'll see, our DNA as people and us as um, a family we get our DNA from the Trinity, and that's what we're talking about today. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, the Trinity is a very interesting subject, and it answers this question. Where do we get our deep desire for family and community? Even extreme introverts want to belong to something. Okay? They say an introvert is somebody that sits at home on Friday night, wishes somebody would call and ask them to do something, and when they call, they wish they could stay home. But everybody... 
wants to be part of something. And if they can't, even an introvert wants to be part of a community of three people where they could have coffee with a friend and go out for coffee with somebody and feel a connection, right? Because we, we desire that. Um, if you don't give a, a child enough love and a connection with their family, they grow up broken. And some of you know what that's like because you, you were hurt as a kid and that connection that you longed for with your father or your mother or friends or siblings um, wasn't there and, and, and it broke you because as a human being, you have a deep desire built into you for family and community. And we get that from the Trinity. We're going to talk about that. We, we desire unity when there's diversity because unity isn't uniformity. Everybody's different, but we want to be united. We desire good communication. We desire selflessness in relationships. You desire that I would serve you, and I desire that you would serve me. You desire that I would go get you a cup of coffee in the morning, and you desire that I would go get you a cup of coffee in the morning, put it simply, right? Um, servanthood, peace. We want peace in our relationships. We want friendship, real friendship. You know what real friendship is? Real friend is somebody you don't have to worry about hurting that they're going to abandon you. You don't have to walk around eggshells around them. A real friend is someone you don't have to, the relationship is secure. And so we all desire that, and we all come from that. That's why we want it, because the Trinity is all that. See, God wasn't lonely. He didn't make us because he was lonely. God is God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they were the three in one. I know it's mind-blowing, but God wasn't lonely. We get created out of that love of that, if you will, that first family. Somebody's got a really cool text song. Did you hear that? <laughs> Whatever that is. Okay. I, I want an R2-D2 one. That would be really good. But we come, we come from that. That's why we want that. And I know it's, it's kind of hard to understand, but where do we get this desire? It's from God because he was the first. And this is a beautiful symbol of the Trinity. And just look at it for a second. You can see God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, the three in one, and this, the white circle means they're, it's all God. It's just, it's mind-blowing, but this is what the Bible says. The word Trinity doesn't appear in the Bible, but it, the Trinity is in the Bible. Tertullian was the first guy to coin the phrase. But look at Genesis now, look at 126. This is the first appearance of the Trinity in the Bible. Okay, you'll notice in the beginning, verse 1, and then we're going to cut down to 26. Verse 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So the whole chapter says God did this, God did that, God did this, God did that. He created light, he created animals, he created um, land creatures, birds of the air, the sun and the moon. Now we get down to verse 26, and the way it describes God in the creation switches a little bit. Look what it says. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. See the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. See how it switches? Where it's, it was talking about the one God, now it's saying it's the one, the three in one in verse 26, 27. It's amazing. It says, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. So we are like God. We are designed to be a community to reflect his image. We are made in the image of the Trinity. And that's why the world doesn't work when sin wrecked that image. Because we were all together at the beginning of creation. Adam and Eve never had an argument. It wasn't Adam here and Eve here. It wasn't go shine my shoes, honey, and bring me my tea. He would have just got up and gone and got her tea. And then shine her shoes and vice versa. It was a perfect community. But sin got in there and wrecked it. Sin is that thing that wrecked the Trinity's image in us. And we were made to be this, where, it, you know, for instance, it would be something like, you know, Bob, Sandra, and Bethany, let's say, for, for a family. We were all together, and sin blew that apart. So what Jesus came to do was to restore the family, the image of the Trinity in us. And that's why the Scruggs were able to get back together once that image had been restored in their heart where they realized it wasn't just about me, it was about 
us. It wasn't about me first. It was Jesus first. We are second. And it got fixed that way. See, the, God's image of the Trinity was restored in the Scrug family after seven years. It's amazing stuff. The Trinity was the first community. Okay? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uncreated and pre-existent. God didn't have a birthday. We came from an uncreated God. Okay? And that, that is mind-blowing and beautiful to me. The Trinity is one God who eternally exists as three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who are each fully and equally God in eternal relation to each other. That's just mind-blowing stuff too, but that is what the Trinity is. To say that each member is a person doesn't mean that each member became human. Only God the Son, Jesus, became human. But each member thinks, acts, feels, speaks, relates. The Bible says that you can dismiss the Holy Spirit. You can hurt his feelings. You can tell him to get lost. You can grieve him. You can hurt him. Because he is a person. The Holy Spirit is not the force. I'm in the force and the force is with me. No, that's not it. The Spirit of God is not, he's a person. And he is what comes into our heart when we ask him. We'll go over that later. So another way to put it real carefully, and I'm real quickly rather, I'm going to, Get this academic stuff out of the way because it's not my forte. But look at this. It's, it's a really good picture. The Father, the, the Holy Spirit, and the Son. Um, the Father is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Son. The Son is not the Father. Okay? But the Son is God. You see that? The Father is God. The Holy Spirit is God. So they're not three gods. It's one God and three persons. It's, that's all I can say. Okay? And that's why it takes faith. And we're going to talk about that. Okay? One God and three persons, but not three gods. Now, this is how the Trinity played in history. Okay? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit made us, created the earth. We, we are his, his creation, or in verse 126, let us make Ryan and Mallory in my image, in our image, right? It's the, the Trinity made us. But this is how it played in creation. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit saw that the world was falling apart because of sin. We got selfish. We walked away from God. We flew apart. The Father sent Jesus the Son to earth to save us. He became, God the Son became a man. And when you die and the end of time, you will see the man Jesus sitting on the throne. He's still a human being. He became a human forever. There's a human being sitting on the throne of the universe. The God-man Jesus. Fully God, fully man. Jesus. The Father sent the Son to be born at Christmas time. Grow up like one of us, die for my sin on the cross, rise from the dead at Easter, and then the Son, oh, sorry, I went backwards. The Son ascended to the Father in Acts chapter 1. And you guys really should bring a pen and a highlighter when we go over these things later. But the Son then sent the Holy Spirit to us. He said that in Acts 1.8. He would ascend to heaven, then he'd send the Spirit of God into us. We have the Spirit of Jesus in us. That's why he had to go back. Otherwise, Jesus would be like the Pope, and you'd have to go to where Jesus was going to be on his tour of Europe. And you'd have to wait along the sides of the street for the Jesus car, the Jesus mobile to come by, and you'd catch a glimpse. So Jesus said, I want to be with all my, my friends, my saints, my family. So he went to heaven and sent the Spirit who is omnipresent everywhere at once. And we get the spirit of Jesus in each of us. And now that's why a church building is just a building. Because you guys are the church. You guys are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God is in you, right? And you're a kingdom of priests. You have direct access to God. You don't need a man to forgive your sin. You don't need a man to pray for you. One guy said in the store, will you pray for this cross and bless it? And I said, you can talk to Jesus just like me. He says, I can and I said, yes, if you have faith in him. Because it's not about a system now. It's the spirit of God is in us. Now, here's the cool thing, what the spirit does for us. The spirit makes us more like God and makes, takes us into the Trinity. We are now united with God through the Holy Spirit. So you see how it's a beautiful thing that the Trinity has done in us, for us, God sent God the Father sent the Son, who sent the Spirit, who brings us into the family of God. We are joined with him one spirit. That's why I can meet a saint from another country, and instantly we have a bond. 
And it, uh, when I went to Taiwan, I was like, these people are amazing. And it was, it's like we've been best friends forever. And that was the Spirit of God that unites us. So it's, it, the Spirit of God is a beautiful thing. We're going to talk about him more in depth later on in the series. The word Trinity doesn't appear in the Bible, but the Bible's in the Trinity. Now we're going to get your swords out, my dad used to say when we were kids, okay? Get your swords out. You get your pew Bibles? Okay, here we go. Your chair Bibles. Who coined that term pew anyway? Because pew, it doesn't sound nice. I, I, I don't know. It's the sound of the Star Wars blasters. Pew, pew. Okay. Um, turn to Luke. You'll see the Trinity. And this is where you should get a highlighter or a pen right in the corners of your Bible. We see the Trinity in the announcement of Jesus' birth. It's beautiful. Okay. Luke chapter 1, verse 35 Remember, you can take one of these Bibles home and put your name in it if you need a Bible. It says, The angel said to Mary, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High, that's the Father, the power of God the Father, will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. There's the whole Trinity. The Spirit will overpower you, and the power of the Most High Father will overshadow you, and the Son of God will be born to you. That's a beautiful picture of the Trinity. Look at this, Matthew 3. Head back, hang a left. My friend Norm the trucker used to say. Matthew 3. I want to hear the Bible pages turning, people. Come on. I'm not doing this. This is the Word of God. You need to be turning in your Bible. Okay, that's why we got Bibles. So turn in your Bible to Matthew 3. Okay. Look at verse 16 and 17. After his baptism, Jesus, as he's coming up out of the water, the heavens were opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. And the voice from heaven said, this is my dearly loved son. That was the father speaking. He brings me great joy. So there in the birth and the, and, and the baptism of Jesus, you see the Trinity. And look at this. Now turn to Matthew 28, the end of the book. This is the great commission Jesus gave each of us. Matthew 28. Look down at verses 19 and 20. That's page 760, 760. Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. This is after his resurrection. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations. And he says, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptize them in the Trinity, in the name of the Trinity. And that's why I always say that when I baptize someone, because Jesus said, so the Trinity, Jesus talks about the Trinity when he was getting ready to go back to heaven. Now go a little more to your right, skip John, and go to the book of Acts chapter 1. Okay? Oh, skip John and Mark, I'm sorry. And Luke, wow, I was really off. Okay. Okay. Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. Okay, it's page uh, 830. Okay, look at verse, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will then be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and even to Sycamus. So what Jesus is saying, I'm going back to heaven and you wait in Jerusalem in prayer and I'll send the Holy Spirit and he will be the engine that gives you the power to go and serve me. So whenever you guys do something that um, touches someone's life, even if it's over a cup of coffee or the way you wrote a blog about something the Lord's doing in your life, or when you um, invite a friend to Dan Bremnus and they come and there's a bridge built to them, the Spirit of God was the engine and the power that gave you that desire to even bring your friend. And they came because he, he made a way for them to come. And you see, the Holy Spirit's what powers our church. You take the Spirit out of here, you got a cold, empty church religion that will die that's why so many churches die, because they don't have the power of the Spirit. So we have to pray for the power of the Spirit for our church. So you see, in all these things, you can see the Trinity at work. You're starting to see how important it is. Now, what Ty read is from 1 John 4, 9 to 16. And it, the Trinity shows up in this beautiful passage he read. God showed how much he loved us by sending his Son. So God the Father sent the Son, so we all might have eternal life. And this is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. And this is the Trinity showing up so beautifully. And God has given us his spirit as proof 
that we live in him and he in us. Furthermore, we've seen with our own eyes and we testify, the Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. All who declare that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them. You have God living in you. It's a beautiful picture. God is love. And that's how we know God lives in us, John says. All who live in love live in God. There's the proof whether you're a Christian or not. You can love people. And God lives in them. You see, it's not just academic knowledge. It's not knowing theology. It's not even memorizing scripture and getting every word right. It's not knowing what date King Nebuchadnezzar was king. It's knowing how to love people because God's love lives in you and flows out of you. That's the sign of the Trinity in the church, is that we know how to love people. The Trinity is the definition, the example, and the source of love. So, you see, because we came from love, we love. And that love gets poured in us. It's like a cup. And when you pour water into that cup, when it gets full, it then spills over onto those around it. And that's what the church is supposed to be. We are the receptor for the love of God. And so he changes our town by pouring his love of the Trinity into us. We are to love like the Trinity because the Trinity is the definition of family. Now, this is something Tim Keller wrote. I want to just get past this. So we are the definition. We're this picture. Our response to the Trinity. Okay, first thing. You just got to have faith because I gave you what I could to explain the Trinity and you still don't get it. And that's okay because bring me a worm that can comprehend a man and I will show you a man that can comprehend God. But you know what some people have done? Russell Taze heard about the Trinity and Russell Taze 150 years ago decided it can't be true. So he became a Unitarian and he founded the Jehovah's Witnesses who do not believe that Jesus is God. He's just the Michael Arche He's the angel Michael Arche Oh, come on, Bob. He's the archangel Michael, and that's it. He was a created being. See, he didn't have faith. He had to figure it out. So what he did was he came up with his own system to cut the Trinity out of the Bible. But you just have to have faith. That's the first thing you have to do. Because, you know, we're a worm to God. Put it that way. I don't understand him. A worm doesn't understand me, right? So you just got to have faith in the mystery and then you have to have humility. And this is where many human beings won't ever have faith and trust in God is because they don't have the humility to ask God for help. You don't have the humility to say, help me understand you. Help me to be like you. You have to ask for the Spirit of God. And this is how you become a Christian. This is how you get power and right now in January you're feeling dry and you're feeling empty and you feel like I can't make a difference and I'm stuck and I'm never going to change and I suck and I am a lousy person and I have no strength and energy. I don't want to pray. I don't want to pick this Bible up and read a little bit of the book of John every day. It's because you need more of his help. You need the spirit of God to come and be the engine and so you start your day by saying, I'm going to breathe in the Holy Spirit. I'm going to get up and I'm just going to concentrate on him and say, Holy Spirit, all my thoughts are coming and rushing at me like wild animals. My list, my to-do list is massive. I can't do this, Lord. Give me your spirit so I can do this, so I can believe in you. Start my day off, right? Cup of coffee with Jesus. Have some energy. Concentrate on him. Listen to some spirit-filled music that will give you some vision for your life. And then pray, Lord, give me an opportunity. I just need an opportunity to live for you. And he'll bring those opportunities your way. But you have to ask for the Spirit's help. And then you've got to love like the Trinity loved. And how do we do that practically? It's easy when you break it down in real life. We screwed up in a massive way. And what did God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit do? Love kicked into high gear right away. Didn't wait for us to ask for help. He sent the help. So how do we love like the Trinity? When we see someone needs help, we love like the Trinity and love kicks in the high gear and we go do something about it. And how do we love like the Trinity? God the Son said, I will die to save them, Father. Let's do this. And so you give yourself to selflessness like Christ. 
and you just give up your rights and you go and you serve and you clean a toilet. My dad told me about a pastor that decided that what he was going to do was go to all the hotels in town in a small town and say, look, I'll clean all your toilets for you for free. And he was the toilet cleaning pastor, the bathroom cleaning pastor, and he went around to every hotel in town and they loved the job he did. He did such a good job on all those bathrooms. And guess who they phoned whenever they needed some help? It was that pastor who didn't mind being like the Son of God and serving in that way. So serve like Jesus. That's how you love like the Trinity. And then how do you love like the Holy Spirit? He's the comforter. He doesn't blast us when we need help or we're weak or we screw up. He blesses us with his presence. And he just says, I love you. I'm going to sit with you. And he doesn't condemn us. So go be like the Holy Spirit and love like the Trinity and just go sit with somebody that needs to be picked up. And don't lecture them. Love them. Just sit with them and accept them the way that we're accepted into the the love of the Trinity. You see, it's very practical, guys. And it's not just cold doctrine. And you glorify other people. Tim Keller said this. I thought it was awesome, so we'll read it. To glorify something or someone is to praise, enjoy, and delight in them. When something is useful, you're attracted to it for what it can bring you or do for you. But if it is beautiful, then you enjoy it simply for what it is. Just being in its presence is, is its own reward. To glorify someone is also to serve or defer to him or her, like the Trinity does Instead of sacrificing their interest to make yourself happy, you sacrifice your interest to make them happy. And why? Because your ultimate joy is to see them in joy. See, that's love. Can you imagine the gold medalists at the Olympics going there and saying, man, when someone wins that gold medal and I got the silver, I'm so happy for them they win that gold medal. That would be an amazing love. And that would be the love of God because he loves to see us happy. Jesus said, I came to give you joy and joy to the full. Not just a religion, but happiness. He wants us happy. And that's why we want people to know him, so they can be happy in him and have a fulfilled life. Don't worry, I'm almost done. So simply, God is love. And all who live in love, John says, live in God, and God lives in them. So you see, if you want to be like God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, be the perfect family, then what you believe will be what you be. You will be what you believe. And so this week, I'd ask you to start your day off by just saying, Lord, immerse me in this great love that you gave and help me to be that to the people around me and help me to believe that you love me that way. So would you guys bow your heads? I'm going to get the band up here and we're going to sing a great song about the love of God because he's forever called forever.